Nanjana Shalakaya Chatsurun Militanye Na Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasari Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our study of the Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti Vai Bhav and we are on the fifth canto and this evening we are looking at chapters first of all 25 and then 26. This is the last two chapters in the fifth canto and this is also the last session in this unit of Srimad Bhagavatam Bhakti Vai Bhav. All right, so we're going to look at chap chapter 26. Let me share the screen here. Mm. <coughs> okay, chapter 25, the glories of Lord An An Ananta. So Ananta Shesha, residing in the bottom of the universe, holding up the whole universe like a mustard seed on one of his thousands of hoods. So we're told there are 14 divisions in the universe. Just to review a little, 14 divisions within the universe. Earth is number seven from the top. Who's on the top? What's the highest planet in the universe? Satyaloka Maharaj. Yes, Satyaloka. And below Satyaloka, then it's Tapaloka, right. And below Tapaloka, Mahaloka. Maha Mahaloka and then Janaloka, right? So those yeah. those four planets are up there. And then after that, then we come to... After that, then we come to the the three worlds, you know? Bu, Buva and Swa. So Swargaloka is there. After Janaloka, going down, we come to Swarg. The heavenly planets, and then Bhuvarloka, and then Bhumandala, where Earth is. So Earth is number seven there in the universe. And then below Earth, what happens below Earth? What have we got below Earth? Sorry, what? Atala, Vitala, Sutala, Talatala, Mahatala, Prasatala, Patala. Okay, very good, yes. You've got the names all down. Very nice. Okay, so the seven regions, the seven subterranean heavenly planets are the Bilaswar Loka. And then below that, then we have the, we have be, below Patalaloka, we have. Pitra Loka, Maharaj. Huh? Pitra, 
Pitriloka Maharaj. Pitriloka is there, yes. Who else is, who is living there? Who's in charge of Pitriloka? Lord Yama. Yamaraj, right. So Yamaloka is there with Pitriloka. And below that, so that's, that's like N Narak, right? That's yes, Narak Loka. <laughs> The hell. And below that, below Yamaloka, we come to the Garbadak Ocean. Right? The Garbadak Ocean is below that. So Lord Ananta Shesha, he is residing there. Sometimes sometime they say, Kurma is there and Anantashesha is resting on Kurma. And in this way Kurma is supporting the universe. And Kurma is supporting Anantashesha and Anantashesha is holding up the universe. Alright, so that's the, the, the geography of the universe. Let's have a look at what's going on here in this chapter. Sukadeva Goswami said to Maharaj Parikshit, approximately 240,000 miles beneath the planet Pata Patala lives another incarnation of Lord Vishnu known as Lord Ananta or Lord Sankarshyan. Lord Sankarshyan, right? We have heard about Lord Sankarshan. Who was a great devotee of Lord Sankarshan? Lord Shiva Maharaj. Yes, Lord Shiva is a great devotee of Sankarshan. Chitraketu Maharaj. Yes, Chitraketu is also a great devotee of Sankarshan, right. We heard about Chitraketu in the sixth canto. When you were covering chapter six, we heard And it appears also Narada Muni is also very devoted to Lord Sankarshan. Because who, who was the guru of Chitraketu? It was Narada, right? Narada and Angira Maharaj. Narada and Angira were the gurus of Chitraketu. And so from him they got the knowledge, the, they heard the Mahavidya and they heard and they made him a devotee of Lord Sankarshan. And we heard also, or we'll hear in this chapter, how Narada Muni is chanting the names of Lord Sankarshan. So, Lord Sankarshan is the deity of Tamagun. So, he, or, or rather, Lord Shiva is the deity of Tamagun. Therefore, sometimes Anantashesha is called Tamasi because of the connection. Lord Ananta is the predominating deity of the material mode of ignorance as well as the false ego of all conditioned souls. When a conditioned living being thinks, I am the enjoyer and this world is meant to be enjoyed by me, this conception of life is dictated to him by Sankarshan. We know also Lord Balaram got the name Sankarshan. When Gargamuni came to do the name giving ceremony at the home of Nanda Maharaj, Lord Balaram was given the name Sankarshan. So Sankarshan is an expansion of Lord Balaram and the expansion of Sankarshan is Lord Shiva. And we heard Sankarshan, Lord Sankarshan is the predominating deity of this false conception that we're thinking ourselves to be the doer, we're thinking ourselves to be the controller. Prabhupada writes in the purport, Text number one, although such a demoni demoniac living entity 
is only an insignificant part of the Supreme Lord. He forgets his true position and thinks he is the Supreme Lord. Because this forgetfulness is created by Sankarshan, he is sometimes called Tamasi. So this is the position of the conditioned souls, that we are under the influence of the modes of nature, and Lord Sankarshan controls the false ego, and that false ego causes us to think in so many ways. But Lord Sankarshan, he's always transcendental, he's never affected. Even though Lord Sankarshan is the super soul of Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva may perform tamasic activities, but Lord Sankarshan is not influenced. So we heard, so Sukadev Goswami goes on to describe more about Lord Ananta Shesha how he has thousands of hoods and he's holding the universe just like a, a white mustard seed. Then in text number three, very interesting, we hear about Lord Ananta and his main function, how his function is to destroy the, the creation. At the time of the devastation, Lord Ananta Shesha destroys the creation and he becomes a little angry. Why does he become angry? Prabhupada explains that because he sees the living entities, that they had the chance to become Krishna conscious, but they did not take it. When they misuse this opportunity and do not go back home, back to Godhead, Lord Sankarshan becomes angry. Right? We have the opportunity to become God conscious and to go back to Godhead, but we don't take it. So Lord Sankarshan becomes a little angry when he sees so many living entities waste a valuable opportunity that they had. Very unfortunate. And it's described here how the Rudras, the, the eleven Rudras all come out of that, the, they come out of the forehead of Sankarshan and they perform the work of devastating the entire creation. Of course, that will depend on what kind of devastation is taking place. There's a partial annihilation at the end of Brahma's day, and there will be a total annihilation at the end of Brahma's life. So different two different kinds of annihilation. And some other, kind, some other times there may be a partial annihilation in the course of the day of Brahma. Then text 4 goes on to describe about the beauty of Lord Sankarshan, that he's very attractive. And he's so attractive that he's, he's so attractive that when the leaders of the snakes offer their obeisances, they become very joyful upon seeing their own faces reflected in his toenails. <laughs> their cheeks are decorated with glittering earrings and the beauty of their face is extremely pleasing to see. And so, describing about the beauty of the Lord, and then it goes on to describe about how the beautiful princesses of the serpent kings 
that they're given the opportunity to put some sandalwood paste and a guru pulp on the arms of the Lord. And when they do this, just by touching the body of the Lord, it awakens their lusty desires within them. And Lord Anantashesh, he can understand their mind. And he looks at the princesses with a merciful smile. And the princesses become bashful because they can understand that he knows their desire. Then they smile and look upon the Lord's face, which is naturally attractive. So what is happening here? It's a description of a very intimate dealing between, a young, between the Lord, Anantashesha, and these princesses. So we should not misunderstand what's being described here. In the material world, when a man and a woman contact each other, well, Prabhupada explains in the purport here, we'll just read the first sentence. When males and females touch each other's bodies, their lusty desires naturally awaken. So it appears from this verse that Lord Ananta Shesha and the princesses of the serpent kings, that they're lusty. And certainly it's, it's, the descriptions indicate that the lust was awakened. However, we should understand there's a difference between lust in the material world and lust in the spiritual world. Of course, this is not the spiritual world, but these are pure devotees. We're talking about the Lord, Lord Ananta Shesha, his expansion of Lord Sankarshan, and, and he's the expansion of Lord Balaram, who's the expansion of Lord Krishna. So he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's not an ordinary conditioned soul. And similarly, the, the princesses of the serpent kings are all pure devotees. They're all in this, they're, they're directly able to serve Lord Anantashesha. So they have to be very pure devotees, otherwise they wouldn't get that opportunity. So, does this mean that even they become lusty? We have to understand the difference between lust in the material sense and lust on the spiritual platform. Just like Prabhupada explains, there's a difference between iron and gold. Then we have the example, the gopis were lusty for Krishna and Kubja was also lusty for Krishna. So Kubja's lust is compared to iron and the gopis' lust for Krishna is compared to gold. In the same way there's lust on the spiritual platform and there's lust on the material platform. Lord Anantashesha cannot become lusty because if he becomes lusty, it means he becomes controlled by the false ego. But the false, the false ego, we heard, he is the controller of false ego. It is coming from him. He is the lord of the false ego. So we should not think that Lord Anantashesha is under the control of his own potency. But the purpose of telling us about this is to help us to understand that there is transcendental love on the spiritual platform. And that is called Adi Ras. Adi Ras, the original relationship, loving relationship between the Lord and his devotees. And this Adi Ras 
is there in the spiritual world between Radha and Krishna. So this is a preparation for what's going to come in the tenth canto. Because if we're not prepared for it, when we read the tenth canto and we hear about Krishna's dealings with the gopis, we'll become confused and we'll think, oh, it sounds very lusty, it sounds very mundane. We will not understand the Lord's dealing with his devotees. So here, in this section of Srimad Bhagavatam, Sukadeva Goswami is set, pe preparing the groundwork for the future, that we'll go on to understand more about the Lord and his transcendental dealings with his devotees, how he can enjoy loving relationships with them. Is that clear to everybody? Anybody has any questions on this? Manaj, in the verse number three, uh, Rudra appears from Ananta. But uh, we have seen, you know, Rudra came from the eyebrows of uh, Lord Brahma. What is the connection between this pastime and uh, the Brahma's pastime, Maharaj? Well, that the Shiva who came from the eyebrows of Brahma, that was at the beginning of the creation. But these Rudras who are coming from St. Kushan, they're coming at the time of the devastation. And they're coming to take on the work of the devastation. So these are... There's some difference here. You know, we know at the beginning of the creation, the Rudras who were created from Lord... Well, first of all, Lord Shiva came from Brahma's anger. And so that the Rudra principle, that anger is often there. And then Prabhupada gives... He lists many different phenomena in nature which display the Rudra principle. And he talks even about how sometimes uh, powerful sannyasis may show the Rudra principle when they get angry. And sometimes it's, uh, it's in nature where you have uh, thunderstorms and thunderbolts and crashing, uh, heavy, heavy rain and earthquakes even. This is all like the Rudra principle. Anger within the material, within the material nature. So, at the end of the, at the, when the time comes for the devastation, for the destruction of the universe, then at that time also it seems that there's rudras who manifest themselves, because the rudras who appeared at the beginning of the creation, they gave a lot of trouble. So they were sent to do meditation, they were sent away, you know, they were told to go into, uh, into seclusion and just sit and meditate, not to disturb every, everyone. Because their, their behavior and their activities just created so much trouble. So these Rudras were created and of course they have a particular function and St. Krishna's function is for the destruction. So they appear in order to devastate the entire creation. So that's how I see the, the difference between the Rudras. Now, the Lord can manifest, Lord Sankarshan can manifest these Rudras. He can manifest them and they can, he can manifest them again and then again. He can go on, can produce them again. So they were there, they came at the beginning to help some purpose of creation. Well, not to help, but due to the anger of Brahma they came. And then at the end of, when the time comes for the devastation, then they come at that time also. Okay, thank you very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Uh-huh, my obeisances. Uh, Maharaj, uh, 
this Pitruloka, we have seen that uh, Aryama is uh, the head over there, and when Yamaraj uh, gets the curse and he comes as Vidura, Aryama takes charge of uh, Pitruloka. But here, um, sorry, Aryama takes charge of uh, Yamaloka. So, but here it says like Pitruloka, Yamaraj is the head, chief. Yes, usually Yamaraj is the head. But it was only for a period of 100 years he, he got cursed and had to become Vidura. He got a break, right? And after, after the 100 years was up, he came back, took up his post again. You have to understand Yamaraj is a title. It's a name, just it, Brahma, Indra, these are all titles. These are names given to the demigod who takes that position. So whoever's in that position, they get the name Yamaraj or Indra or Brahma. So when Aryama became Yamaraj, he was still his Yamaraj, although, but Aryama was doing it, you know, but he was Yamaraj because he's in that position. It's a title, just like headmaster, you know, somebody's a headmaster, you know. So the headmaster may change, he may go away for a while, someone else becomes a headmaster. Okay, Maharaj, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, same, uh, related to the same question, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, is, uh, Yamaraj's name is also, uh, I mean, another name of Yamaraj is Aryama. Because no. in Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says in 10th chapter, uh, Pitrunam Aryama Chasmi. Of the Pitrus, I am Aryama, the Lord says. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, Aryama is, well, all I remember was that he got, the, he got the position to be Yamaraj when Yamaraj was cursed. So in what it says in Bhagavad Gita, among, among the Pitris is Aryama. So Aryama, he, but we heard also Yamaraj is also like the king of the Pitris, right? <laughs> so when our Yama is there, that's maybe why he got that job to be Yamaraj because he's 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 so much in touch with the Pitris. He knows what's going on. He's conscious about how the Pitris are thinking. You know, Pitris all thinking about their families. And best wishes for their concern for their families. So our Yama, he's, he's the leading Pitri. He's the one who takes care of all these people who come up to Pitri Loka. He's got that job. Krishna recognizes him. Yeah, we don't have a lot of information on all this stuff. Prabhupada didn't give us a lot of details about this, didn't consider it very essential for us. But, you know, just some basic things are there. Okay, so Aryama becomes, he's, among the Pitris, he's Aryama. Krishna recognizes Aryama as being one of the head of the Pitris. So, as we said, Aryama also becomes Yamaraj, and Yamaraj is also king of Pitris. And they're different people. You know, Yamaraj is more known for punishing the sinful, but Aryama is more into dealing with the Pitris. <laughs> right? Different, different tasks, different services under one title, you could say. Okay, we'll go ahead. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. All right, so coming up to text number six, we hear about uh, the wonderful qualities of Lord Sankarshan, and he's none different from the personality of Godhead for the welfare of all living entities within this material world. He resides in his own abode, restraining his anger and intolerance. <laughs> so we, you know, we heard about the snakes uh, when we were talking yesterday, or uh, the last class about the lower planets where the snakes reside, 
how they are often very angry people. So here we see uh, Ananta Shesha also restraining his anger and intolerance. Although he has some anger, he's able to control it. it. It's important that he has this kind of mood of anger and intolerance because he has to do the work of destruction. It's his main service. Prabhupada writes in the purport, this material world is created to give the conditioned souls another chance to go back home, back to Godhead. But most of them do not take advantage of this facility. So that's why Anantashesha gets a bit angry about the whole thing. That people don't take, they have the chance but they won't take advantage. But anyway, he's, he's so he is kind towards us and checks his anger and intolerance. Only at certain times does he express his anger and, and destroy the material world. So Lord Anantashesha understands he has his duty to do at a particular time. Not just at any time, but he, he waits for the appropriate time when he's supposed to perform his that service. So then there's a beautiful description of Lord Anantashesha or Lord Sankushan, similar to what was heard in relation to Chitraketu Maharaj. He's dressed in blue, dressed in bluish garments, just as we, we, would, we would expect, dressed in blue. Who else dresses in blue? Balram and uh... <laughs> yes, right. Balaram, Lord. And wearing a single earring. Is that familiar? Who else is wearing a single earring? Lord Nityananda, usually. And he holds a plough on his back. So Lord Balaram is Haladara. Right, Krishna has a flute to call the living entities and Lord Balaram carries the plough because the plough is used to prepare the field for planting the seeds. So Lord Balaram is the original spiritual master. He's preparing the ground to put in the Bhakti Lara Beach. He's preparing it for all of us to develop our Krishna consciousness. So he carries his plow with him. Alright, and then very nice descriptions. He, he appears to be intoxicated, which is not unlikely. Lord Balaram also would like to get intoxicated. He would drink Varuni and become intoxicated. We're not told anything about why Lord Anantashesha is intoxicated but at least he appears to be intoxicated. So then we're told in text number 8 that any person who is very serious about being liberated, if they just simply hear about Lord Ananta Dev, they can become purified, they can become freed from their bad karma. So this is the power of uh, chanting the holy name and hearing the glories of Lord Sankushan. And when we're also told later on in the verse how Narada Muni always glorifies Anantadev in his father's assembly. So in the, in the assembly of Lord Brahma, Narada Muni glorifies Anantadev, he composes beautiful poetry and they will play stringed instruments and it's mentioned how there's someone called Tumburu who's a friend of Narada Muni and he also sings songs and accompanies Narada Muni in performing, uh, singing the songs and glorifying Lord Anantadev. 
So as we said, Narada Muni is also very devoted to Lord Sankarshan and he brought Chitra Ketu into being a devotee of Lord Sankarshan. So the power of hearing is described, we either, it doesn't matter, you hear about Krishna or you hear about Lord Balaram or you hear about Lord Nisringadev or you hear about Lord, Anand, Lord Sankarshan, it's the same thing. It's all spiritual and it purifies the heart, it cleanses the heart. At the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, as confirmed herein, unless one receives transcendental knowledge in disciplic succession, there is no question of his becoming purified of this contamination. Conta the contamination, what is the contamination? The contamination, of course, is the lust and the, the greed, the influence of the modes of passion and ignorance. The, all the lust, anger, greed, illusion, madness, envy, these kind of things are there contaminating the heart. And the only way we can remove them is by receiving this knowledge, the, the parampara, the knowledge which is passed through the parampara. And this will save us from the influence of the modes of passion and ignorance. So Lord Ananta Shesha has come and he performs many pastimes. We heard, anyway, we heard how he appeared to Chitraketu Maharaj and how he benedicted Maharaj Chitraketu. And Lord Shiva, of course, is his, his great devotee. Lord Shiva always worships Lord Sankarshan. And Lord Shiva is the greatest Vaishnava. So text, eight, text 9 rather describes how the Lord appears in many different forms. And there's a long quote here in the purport, Prabhupada quotes from the Chaitanya Bhagavad. Chaitanya Bhagavad mainly emphasizes the pastimes of Lord Nityananda. And Lord Nityananda is not different from Lord Sankarshan. Lord Sankarshan is the expansion of Lord Balaram, and Lord Balaram and Lord Nityananda are not different. So there's a nice section here just glorifying the power of Lord Anantashesha, how he's holding up the universes just like a mustard seed on his head. Although the universe is so big, Anantashesha hardly notices it, just like a drop of water on his head. He doesn't even notice it, it's on his foot. And Lord Anantashesha is always glorifying the Supreme Lord with his different hoods, is describing the pastimes of the Supreme Lord Krishna. So there's a nice statement here from this Chaitanya Bhagwan. If we simply try to engage in the congregational chanting of the glories of Lord Ananta Dei, the dirty things in our hearts accumulated during many births will immediately be washed away. Therefore, a Vaishnava never loses an opportunity to glorify Ananta Dei. So Lord Ananta Dev is also known as Shesha, the unlimited end. 
because he ends our passage through the material world. Simply by chanting his glories, everyone can be liberated. So we are fortunate that here in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Sukadeva Goswami glorified Lord Sankarshan and gave us an opportunity to be aware of some of the pastimes of Lord Sankarshan. And also we're aware of his different devotees. All right, so this is all the pastimes of the Supreme Lord. And Jiva Goswami gives the example, he said, just like Lord Varaha appears just to please his devotees, to pick up the earth planet from the Garbhadak ocean. So Lord Anantashesha, he appears also for the pleasure of the devotees holding the universes on his head. And then Sukadeva Goswami goes on, just as he did in the previous chapter, he comes to glorify the holy name. Remember in the previous chapter, it was described about Bali Maharaj who gave the three worlds in charity to Lord Bhamanadev. So Sukadeva Goswami may be worried thinking that maybe everyone will think they have to give the three worlds in order to get devotion to Krishna. But on the other hand, Krishna has made devotion to him very easy. Krishna said, a leaf, a flower, fruit, water, if you offer these things, I can accept them. But even if we don't have these things, if we chant the holy name, and, and the Lord is so kind that He said, even if you chant the Holy Name, even you can't chant the Name purely, if you can just chant at the level of Nama Bas, He said, that's enough, that will get, get rid of all of your karma. Everything is changed. Just like Ajamil, he chanted, he didn't chant the pure Name, he chanted at the level of Nama Bas. And so if we chant, unintentionally or jokingly, whatever, if we chant at the level of Nama Bas, it gets you it gets you free of all the sins. So here also in relation to Lord Anantashesha, Sukadeva Goswami brings up the importance of chanting the holy name. Because he's he was telling us we could chant the glories of Lord Sankarshan. So you may not chant Krishna's name, you may chant the name of Lord Sankarshan. And you will get the benefit, we'll get great benefit from that. So Sukadeva Goswami goes on to describe, he said, this entire universe is filled up with so many things, mountains and rivers and oceans, so many living entities, and they're all just like an atom on one of his thousands of hoods. So, it's very difficult for us to describe even a little of the glories of Lord Anantashesha. As Sukadeva Goswami said, Is there anyone, even with thousands of tongues, who can describe his glories? So this is Anantashesha. There's no end to his glories. But of course, we, we are not aware. We don't see him. Therefore, we don't glorify him. But when we hear about him, that should be enough to convince us that there is such a person in the universe. There is Anantashesha, there is Lord Sankarshan. He is a person and he does have different names describing his pastimes and qualities. 
and we can chant these names, we can devote herself to him. In the sixth canto, we see Narada, he gave the mantra to Chitraketu, and Chitraketu chanted that mantra, and then Chitraketu went on to become the king of the Vijadharas. And then after he became king of the Vijadharas, then he developed all mystic powers, and he could go flying everywhere. So he got so much opulence by the grace of Lord Ananta Dev through worshipping Lord Sankarshan. So Sukadeva Goswami describes here, text number 13, though self-sufficient, he himself is the support of everything. He resides beneath the lower planetary system and easily sustains the entire universe. Easily sustains, as we said, just like a mustard seed on his head. He didn't even notice it. Insignificant. So this way Sukadeva Goswami said, he said, so I'm telling you what I've heard from others. I'm telling you about the activities of the Lord, about the nature of this world. I have fully described to you the creation of this material world. So, uh, Maharaj Parikshit had wanted to know how he could see the form of the Lord in the material world. Right? He wanted to know how he could see the form of Lord Vasudev Krishna in the material world. So that was way back in chapter, uh, chapter 16. Or, uh, yeah, chapter 16, where that question came up. We're now, so it's taken 10 chapters. Sukadeva Goswami's been describing to us in detail how we can see the Lord everywhere in the higher planets, in the, in the intermediate planets, in the lower regions of the planets, and how the Lord is even here as an Antashesha in the bottom of the universe, how the Lord is everywhere. There's nowhere you could go where you could be separate from the Lord, because the Lord is everywhere in everything. He's omnipresent. But we have to be able to see, we have to be able to realize the presence of the Lord there. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, I am never manifest to the foolish and the unintelligent. For them I am covered by my eternal creative potency. So Sukadeva Goswami was describing about the nature of this material world. He says, conditioned souls full of material desires achieve various situations in different planetary systems. And in this way they live, in this material world. <laughs> so then Prabhupada quotes the verse from Lord Chaitanya Shikshastikam, how Lord Chaitanya said, I have fallen into the ocean of material existence. Please therefore pick me up and fix me as one of the atoms at your lotus feet. Let us become atoms at the lotus feet of Krishna. So Sukadeva Goswami concludes by saying, I have described how people generally act to their different desires, and as a result get different types of bodies, some in higher and some in lower planets. You inquired of these things from me, I have explained to you whatever I heard from authorities. What shall I speak of now? <laughs> so Sukadeva Goswami wants to know what to speak about now. So that goes on to text number, chapter number 26, and we're going to hear about the hellish planets. Sukadeva Goswami, uh, Maharaj Parikshit asks Sukadeva Goswami, he said, why are the living entities put into different material situations? Kindly explain to me. It should be pretty obvious, right? Why are they put into different situations? Anyway, uh, Maharaj Parikshit wanted to hear this 
from Shukadeva Goswami. So these hellish planets, Naraka Loka, are slightly above the Garbhadak Ocean and remain situated there. So Tsukadeva Goswami, in replying to Maharaj Pariksit, explains about the three modes of nature. So people get a condition according to the modes of nature, according to how they're acting. People in the mode of goodness, they enjoy happiness and they show some religiosity. And people in the mode of passion, they get some happiness along with some distress. But people in the mode of ignorance, they're just, they just get distressed all the time. Their lives are just full of so much misery. So Sukadeva Goswami describes like that, why people get different conditions. And text 3 continues like that. Somebody's pious, they're going to get heavenly life, heavenly condition. And somebody's got a lot of desires, then they're more in the mode of passion. They're going to be more in Bhumandala. And people who are more sinful, they're going to go down into the lower regions, the hellish conditions of life. And Sukadeva Goswami describes three, ty three types of ignorance. He said somebody may simply be mad. So if they're mad, then they, they, they're not punished very severely because, but anyway, they just think, well, he's mad, you know, that's his karma. So the, he doesn't really know what he's doing, so they, they just leave him. But somebody, and somebody acts impiously, but he knows the difference, he understands there's a difference between pious and impious. But he's not very determined to act piously and he does impious things. So he goes to hell and he gets intermediate punishment. But if someone's an atheist, an outright atheist, and he acts impiously, and then he gets really bad punishment. He gets a heavy punishment and he's put into all kinds of different hells to suffer because he's so atheistic, he's so sinful. So we see it's not all one, everything is according to the degree, according to the consciousness of the performer of activities. You get different results. It's not the same for everyone, it's going to be different. So then Maharaj Parikshit has another question. He wants to know about where is this hell? Where is this hellish place? Is it outside the universe or is it inside the universe on different places in the planet? So of course we know, actually this question has already been answered for us. The hellish planets are situated above the Garbhadak Ocean and below the earth, below the earthly region, below Bhumandala, but above the Garbhadak Ocean. So that's where the hellish planets are situated. And we could say it's below Patala. So the, then it mentions in the purple here, Pitri Loka is also located in this region between Garbhadak Ocean and the lower planetary system. All the res residents of Pitriloka, headed by Agnishwata, meditate in great samadhi on the Supreme Personality of Godhead and always wish their families well. <laughs> okay, so that's the uh, Pitris being described. It almost sounds like it's something different from something that, like they have their own planet there. 
the way it's described in the sentence, it's not very clear. I tried to discuss it with Subhag Swami today. I was asking him about what's his understanding about Pitri Loka. And he simply replied to me, he said, well, Prabhupada didn't give us much information on this. He said, you, you know, we don't know much about it, so we can't say much. And it's not described, you can see here in Srimad Bhagavatam, we're not given much information here in Srimad Bhagavatam. Maybe you have to read more, go into Mahabharata or the Puranas, maybe find something there. Anyway, it's not a very significant point because we're devotees. We're not interested in going to Pitri Loka. We want to go back to Godhead. We don't want to waste our time going to Pitri Loka, going to these places. Not very important for us. And we've already transcended all of these kind of things. This is for other people to do. All right, so then we're going to hear about Lord Yamaraj. He's the son of the sun god. And he resides in Pitriloka. Oh, <laughs> okay, so he resides in Pitriloka with his personal assistants and while abiding by the rules and regulations set down by the Supreme Lord, has his agency, Yamaduras, bring all the sinful people. And so you see both activities going on. You have the Pitris coming and you have the sinful people coming. It's just like on the moon, on the moon planet, it said half the planet of the moon is for the Pitris and half the planet is for the Devas. In the daytime, it's the demigods who use it, who go to the moon. But at night, it's the Pitris who go to the moon. So different functions, different times. It's mentioned, Yamaraj is appointed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You see, it's an appointment, it's a position. So he's appointed by the Supreme Lord to see that the human beings do not violate his rules and regulations. If they violate these regulations, they are judged and punished by Yamaraj. So this is the position. And then we're going to hear of what kind of punishments, what kind of hells are there, what's going to happen. And so text number seven describes a total of 20, some say there are 21 hellish planets and some say 28. My dear King, I shall outline all of them according to their names, forms and symptoms. And then the names, names all the different hells for us. 28 different places of hell, of different kinds of punishment in each of these places. So, the chapter then goes on to describe all the different activities which are done in these different hellish planets. Uh, or rather, the, the different sins which people have done, which result in them being put into these different hells. Just like Kumbi Pakaloka. Kumbi Pakaloka. Usually we tell that story at the time of Kartik and we tell about the Brahmana who never did any pious activities. He was always engaged in sinful activities. He never did anything pious. And he died when he was in the holy place during the month of Kartik. So he was taken to Yamaraj and it was decided he should be put into Kumbi Pakaloka. And Kumbi Pakaloka is where they have a big pot of boiling oil. And he was to be fried in the boiling oil. 
So he was taken there and put into the big pot, but when he was put into the boiling oil, all the oil became cool. And so the people were very surprised. All the Yamaduras who were there, they were surprised at what happened. Usually when they go in the boiling oil, they'll scream. They're burnt in the boiling oil. But he got in the boiling oil, the oil became immediately cool. So then it was found out, Narada Muni came and he explained how this Brahmana, although he was sinful, he'd done a lot of bad things, but because he'd observed, it, he watched the activities going on during the month of Kartik. Although he didn't even take part in the activities, but he watched people perform all the different activities which they were doing. He watched them chant mantras, and he watched them perform kirtan, and he watched them worship the deity, he watched them offer lamps. He himself didn't do anything, but he watched all of these people. He'd never seen people do all these things before. So just by watching, he got one-sixth of the benefit of all of their pious activities. And that took away all of his sins. So, it's very important. From this chapter, we're going to hear, well, it, it's already, it, it's made up of these descriptions of these 28 different hellish planets where people suffer for their different sins. But when Maharaj Parikshit hears all of this, then he thinks about how, how can people be saved from this? And of course that leads to the sixth canto and the telling of the pastime of Ajamila. And how Ajamila chanted the holy name and just by chanting the holy name, although it was Namabhas, it wasn't pure chanting, he chanted the name at Namabhas, he got freed from all of his sins. And the Yamaduras couldn't even couldn't arrest him. He was protected by the Vishnu Duras. So that, this is a follow, that's a follow-up to this section here. You, we hear about all these different hells which people can go through. And it's really hell. It's really there's some really horrible, morbid descriptions of some of the hells which people are put into. Not very pleasant, definitely. You hear about these different hells, what people are going to have to suffer for all their sins. So certainly we want to be very careful. We want to be very serious in Krishna consciousness. I'm not going to go through each of the hells. We'll just read a little bit which are marked here. Some points of interest uh, and the purport of text number 15. As Kali Yuga advances, people are becoming godless and taking up so-called secularism. They do not know the punishment awaiting them is in Asi Patravana as described in this verse. So there's a particular hell for people who take up this secularism idea. Secularism, that, oh, there's no need to believe in God, we don't need to speak all this, we don't need to do, sing all these songs and chant all these prayers and things. We just do what we believe in, everybody, whatever we all, we believe in ourselves. we just do that, you know, if it feels good, we do it. And, and this is the mood of people who have this philosophy of secularism. It doesn't matter, you know, there's no God there, nobody's going to punish you, just do what you feel like doing, and if it makes you happy, that's the main thing, you want to enjoy. And yet, we never saw any God, we don't know anything about God, so why should we worry about it? And Prabhupada explains a little more in the purport. He said here, 
However, even if one takes up a different system of religion, according to this verse, he must follow the religious principles he has accepted. Whether one is a Hindu or a Mohammedan or a Christian, he should follow his own religious principles. However, if one comes, if one, con if one concocts his own self, his own, his own religious path within his, 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 within his mind, or if he follows no religious principles at all, then he is punished in the hell known as Asi Putravana. In other words, a human being must follow some religious principles. If he does not follow any religious principles, he is no better than an animal. Right? Animals don't have any religion. And if, we, if you say you don't have any religion, then what is the difference between you and an animal? That is a fact. So, this is being described here. There's a special hell for people who don't want to accept any religion, they, where they go, where they're punished. And there's so many terrible descriptions of hell. People, of course, go there in their subtle bodies. So although they're put into hell, they don't actually die. They just experience the pain. But they don't die because they have a subtle body. They have the subtle body, and because they have a subtle body, they can experience the pain, but they never die. So it's really hell. It's really terrible what, what people go through. Okay, then there's a bit more here. Uh, in text number 23, uh, Prabhupada was talking about how different duties people have. The four divisions of human society are created by Krishna. Even if one is qualified a sudra, he must try to improve his position and become a brahmana. Right? We know in the Kali Yuga, everybody's sudra by birth, kalo sudra sambhavaha. But everybody should try to become a brahmana. No one should try to check a person, no matter what his present position is, from coming to the position of a brahmana or a Vaishnava. Actually, one must come to the platform of a Vaishnava, then he automatically becomes a Brahmana. This can be done only if the Krishna consciousness movement is spread. For we are trying to elevate everyone to the platform of Vaishnava. So this is Prabhupada's mood and mission. We want everyone to get this opportunity. Sometimes people criticize the, the caste system, that, oh, people, if you're not a Brahmana, you don't get the opportunity, you don't get equal rights. But here Prabhupada said, everybody should become a Vaishnava, and then they're automatically a Brahmana. So it's the training which is required, education and training. Anybody can become a Brahmana. The example is given just like bell metal can be made into gold by the alchemical process. In the same way, anyone can become a Brahmana by the process of initiation and training under the bona fide spiritual teacher. So very important. Everyone should try to become Brahmanas, try to train people up. All right, then there were some more points. Uh, 
Let's see. Oh, here's one. The text number 35. Text number 35, it was describing like householders who receive guests or visitors, but they don't welcome them in their home and they may give them dirty looks. You, they look at them, you know, like, why is coming here? Why is disturbing me in my home? And, and it says that you, that you may go to someone's home and they may look at you like they want to burn you to ashes. So these kind of people, they, have, they go to a special hell where he is gazed at by hard-eyed vultures, herons, crows and similar birds. And these birds swoop down and pluck out the eyes with great force. Wow, could you imagine? So you go there and they pluck out your eyes. So Prabhupada talks about the Vedic etiquette, even an enemy who comes to a householder's house should be received in such a gentle way that he forgets that he has come to the home of an enemy. And of course it was like that during the battle of Kurukshetra that in the evening they would meet together and they would dine together and in the daytime they'd go out and fight with each other to kill each other. But in the evening they would meet, they would be friends and meet together. So that's a Vedic culture, that people come to your home, we should think the uninvited guest is actually a, 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 a demigod, come to, talk, come to test me. In Srimad Bhagavatam the example is there of Ranti Dev and how Ranti Dev was fasting and the guest came and how he sacrificed everything he had for his guests. And even a sudra came, and then dogs came, and Ranti gave, gave everything. And he had no regrets. He was happy that, that I just want to have this opportunity to serve others. So that is the Vedic culture. And our Krishna consciousness movement is also like that. Prabhupada sent a letter around all of our centers, said that nobody should go away without prasadam. Everyone who comes to the temple, they must be given prasadam and Prabhupada said what they want, what he wanted them to be given. They should be halava and puri and sabji and like that. He wanted that everybody who came to the temple, they must get prasadam. And he said, you can never say that, oh, there's nothing, oh, there's no prasadam. You must have prasadam available for guests coming. And he said, Krishna is not a poor man. Krishna will provide. So this, the, our, our temple is meant to show that kind of culture. And it shouldn't just be in the temple, it should be also in the home. Householders are meant to do like that. When people would get married, they would ask Prabhupada about what is it my duty as a householder? And Prabhupada would tell them, he said, whenever you cook food, you go to the door and you call out, food is now ready in my home. Anybody who has not taken food, they can come and take in my home. This is how Prabhupada instructed the devotees that they should do like that. Of course, and Prabhupada said when he was a child, Every day in his home, his father would bring five or six people every day to his home to eat. Of course, now the culture is not quite so like that. Okay, then going ahead, uh, there's a nice interesting point in text number 36 in the purport there. Text number 36 was describing about people who are very attached to their wealth and they're thinking, my money, they don't want to use it, they don't like to do any good with it. Uh, so in the purport Prabhupada writes, wherever there is money, it must be engaged in the service of Lord Narayan. 
everyone should use his money to spread the great transcendental movement of Krishna consciousness. If one does not spend money for this purpose, but accumulates more than necessary, he will certainly become proud of the money he illegally possesses. You may say, no, my money is not illegal, but Prabhupada is saying it's illegal because it all belongs to Krishna. It's not really our money, it's Krishna's money. So we have to recognize who is the proprietor. That is the point. Everything belongs to Krishna and whatever we are given, we just take whatever is necessary for our basic needs and the rest we give to Krishna. So that is Krishna Consciousness. And Prabhupada explains, he said, people who are sudras, he said, they don't need money. <laughs> he said, because they won't use it properly. And the brahmana, he doesn't, he shouldn't have money either. Brahmana doesn't want money. Brahmana is interested in self-realization. He's on the path of Brahman. He's not interested in money. And Kshatriyas, if they get money, they will use it to perform yagya, to do a big, big sacrifice, to perform a big yagya for the pleasure of the Lord. And the Vaishyas, they should do honest business, raise the cows or do their trading. And with the money, the profits, they should use it for Krishna consciousness. Or they can give it to the brahmanas, they give it to the devotees, they give some charity. But don't just accumulate to get more and more. And Prabhupada told us, he said, don't keep money in the bank. He said, better you use it to print books. So keep your money in books. That was how Prabhupada instructed the managers of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. He said, whatever income you get, 50% should be spent for book distribution. The other 50% you can use to maintain the temple. So Prabhupada gave us all these rules in the beginning of our movement. Of course now, these things have pretty much been forgotten. You would never hear this now. Of course now it's still book distribution is going on in some places, but often the books are given away free. In the past we used to always sell them, now we give up we give them out freely to people. And people, you know, and it changes the mood. When you give the book freely to people, they, they, they understand, oh, you're not beggars anymore. Before, you know, they thought you're just beggars, you always want to get my money. But when we give them the book, then they think of us differently. It's certainly good for the, the image of our society. We found that, and in, in, we found that some countries like in Thailand, it's a Buddhist country. And the monks are not supposed to have money. So when we go for Sankirtan, then it's very strict. People think it's very strange because monks, you don't have, you're not supposed to have any money. And if you ask people to give donations, you know, it's, it's something very strange to them. So we started to just give out the books and if people want to give something, they can give something. But, you know, we don't, we're, we're not pushy about it, you know, we don't mind if they don't give anything, they're welcome to take the book. And somehow we cover up the cost. Alright, so these are some different points. Oh, here's another point. This is in text number 37. One should be neither pious nor impious. One should be a devotee and surrender to the lotus feet of Krishna. This surrendering process is also very easy. Even a child can perform it. Everyone agree on that? <laughs> 
Surrender is very easy, even a child can perform it. One should be neither pious nor impious. Devotees not pious or impious, a devotee is transcendental, right? We surrender to Krishna. We do everything for the pleasure of Krishna. We're not thinking about piety or impiety. And even Bali Maharaj, when Bali Maharaj gave the three steps of land to Vamanadev, he wasn't thinking he was being pious. He didn't do it to be pious. He, he gave it out of love for the Lord because the Lord came asking for it. So if the Lord wants it, I should give it. Of course, he felt bad that the Lord had to come and ask him for it. He would have preferred that Brihaspati had come himself, that let Brihaspati come, I could have given it to him. Why Lord Vamanadev has to come and ask me to give it? So pious and impious is on the material platform, and a devotee is not on the material platform. We want to be on the transcendental platform. We do everything for Krishna's pleasure. So this is the meaning of surrender, acting for Krishna. So Sukadeva Goswami has described all these different 28 kinds of hell. And then coming up to text 38, he's going to summarize something about what he's been talking about, how one can progress on the path of liberation in the Puranas, vast universal existence. Okay, the vast, the vast form is established, the body of the Lord created by the energy and quality called the Virata Rup. So this was in relation to the question which Maharaj Parikshit had asked at the beginning of this section, that he wanted to know how to remember the Lord in this material world, how to see the Lord in this material world. You can see the similar question was there in the Bhagavad Gita in the 10th chapter. Arjuna also wanted to see how to see the Lord in the material world, make it easier for me to see the Lord. And so Krishna spoke vibhuti yoga, and Krishna spoke about 80 different vibhutis there in the 10th chapter. So here also in Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Krishna, uh, Sukadeva Goswami rather, has been describing about the universe and the different planets and the, how the, everything is arranged within the universe and how it's all the Lord, that in everything the Lord is there. It's the Lord's, it's, it's arranged by Him and He's personally there in so many different forms. As the Sun God, He's there and He's there also, as, as we heard, as Ananta Shesha holding up all the universe and He's there uh, also on the, the pole star, He's residing there. And so practically everywhere in everything the Lord is there. And he has his hands on, he's overseeing everything. And so Prabhupada's purport, text 38, he said, Krishna consciousness movement is pushing forward the publication of Srimad Bhagavatam, as explained especially for the understanding of the modern civilized man, to awaken him to his original consciousness. Without this consciousness, one melts into complete darkness. Oh, horrible, huh? Melt into darkness without Krishna consciousness. So Srimad Bhagavatam is very important. One who is interested in liberation, accepts the path of liberation, is not attracted to conditioned life. So mentioned here, text 39, a person should first, first control his mind by thinking of the virata rup. 
the gigantic universal form of the Lord. And then gradually think of the spiritual form of Krishna after hearing of both forms. So this is an interesting approach, how people can gradually come to understand the form of the Supreme. First of all, appreciating the Lord through the elements of the material universe as the Virata Rup, and then coming to see the form of the Lord, the spiritual form of the Lord. And this way then one can be become fully realized. Okay. Are there any questions? Anyone has any questions on this section? We've been hearing about Anantashesha, now we're hearing about the different hells. Not a very pleasant topic. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Maharaj, I have a question, not directly very related to this, but close to it. The, is Prabhupada told that there anything about the samskara, a person when dies in the family, whatever we should do, anything Prabhupada has mentioned specifically for the devotee or the non devotees? When people die, about what we should yeah. well what, what we should perform what we should perform well uh, Prabhupada taught us to do things like chant the holy name and do kirtan after they leave the body or at the time of them leaving the body you want to you want to have a kirtan you don't want to be you want to be chanting the holy name and Prabhupada taught us by his own example. What did Prabhupada want when he was leaving the body? He wanted all the devotees there. He wanted us all to chant the holy name. And he had a devotee sit by his side and read the book of his guru. And he was wearing a deity garland. So, somebody leaves a body. You want to get a garland of flowers offered to the deities and put it round their neck before you take them to the, crema to the crematorium. And you want to give them a bath, you, ideally you want to have some Ganga water. Now we, have, we get these little bottles of Ganga Jal. And so you get some Ganga Jal and you can wash the, wash the person's mouth out with Ganga water. And you can bathe them a little bit, wipe their skin with the Ganga water. And it's very nice because before going to crematorium, usually you give the bath to the body. Right? And then, and then you can put also Tausi, put Tausi on, in the hand or uh, put Tausi on, 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 in their hands or on, on their tongue even, or you can put it on their eyes even, mm -hmm. and then uh, and what, sorry. And, and after, after they departed, then about, you know, a few days after they departed, then you have the Smriti Sabha, and you know, you, you, you can have a feast in honour of the person. You have a feast in their honour, and you invite the devotees, you feed the devotees after somebody departs. You want to feed the devotees. And if the devotees are happy, then the devotees will give their blessings for the departed soul. So that's very good. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is enough. We do not have to do any rituals, what generally Hindu tradition rituals are there. This is enough? I don't know what rituals you mean. They do for 12 days, some, 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 so many things that they do, Pindadan and all other things. 
Well, it's up to you if you want to do these things, you know. These are more, these are more karma, karma kandi things, you know. Mm. We, we, we follow the devotee path, you know. If you, have the rich, if you have the ceremony done by a devotee, it's better. But if you bring in people who are not Vaishnavas, then they will do all of these things. They'll tell you to do all of these things, you know, which are more karma kandi. Thank you, Mother. Of course, it's also nice that you take the ashes to the Ganga after the per you know, if you're not near the Ganga, if you don't, if your person leaves the body somewhere in a city or something, then you get the ashes and you take one up portion of the ashes and you bring it to the Ganga or to the Yamuna and you put it in there, you do a little puja there and put it in the water of the Ganga or the Yamuna. That's also very good for the departed soul. So we do that, many, many people do that, they will bring their ashes every year. We even have a day before Gaur Purnima, there's one day we call it the ash immersion. And many people will come with ashes and they'll put it the together, they'll all do it together and put the ashes into the Ganga. So these kind of things are very good for the departed soul. I ask this question because many times we hear that all this is good for devotees because we are not in a very high level of devotee, so we should perform the other things also. So I just wanted to clarify from you. Is there Prabhupada has any given instruction about it? Mm, not really. Uh, Prabhupada, I don't know. You know, we didn't have many deaths in Prabhupada's time, you know. We were all so young. <laughs> I never saw anybody die, and you know, it was very, very rare, anybody. You know, there was one, one devotee left the body, Jayananda. He had done a... Uh, there were a few people, but I, don't, I didn't, didn't hear Prabhupada actually giving a lot of instruction about these things about what we needed to do. Prabhupada was more concerned in what we do when we're alive. That's much more important. What we do when we're in the body, that's the important part. Not what we do once we leave the body. Thank you, Madam. There are two questions in the chat box, Maharaj. Uh -huh. uh, the first question is, when the soul suffered for their sins in Naraka Loka in so many ways, then why are they again sent to other Lokas to suffer in different bodies? Well, what, what, what happens after they suffer in, in hell, then they come back up to earth and they take birth somewhere on the earthly planet and they'll, and they'll come gradually, they come up, they don't come up immediately from hell. It's not like they come right out of Yamaraj's punishment and then come up to the human form of life again. It's not like that. But after being punished in hell, they may take birth in some animal body for some time, in different species of animals before, but before they come again to the human form of life. And then when they come to the human form of life, then the, the, their birth will be on this earthly region, which we said is karma, the, the karma bumi, 
It's a place where we're earning our karma and it will determine what kind of body we will take in the future. Whether or not we'll go up, if we, if we are very pious in, the, in, in our life here on this earth planet, then we can go up, we'll take up a body in a more heavenly atmosphere with greater sense gratification, like that. But if people are very sinful and very attached to sense gratification on this life, in this lifetime here, then they'll go back down again. They're going to go back to the hellish planets again. They're going to go down again or they'll take an animal body. If people are very, very attached to sense gratification, then they don't need, they don't need to go up to the heavenly planets. They don't need a human form of life. They can just because they just want to eat, they just want to sleep, or they just want to have sex, so they can take the animal body and do that. They don't need to have a human body to do these activities. So that's the point. People get a body according to their desire, according to their desire and their qualification. We earn their body by our own activities. And some people are actually happy to be in these bodies of animals. Some, just like when Indra was cursed to become a pig, he was happy. He didn't want to leave. So people are put into the body of a dog and they think it's nice. One, one young man was saying to Prabhupada, what's wrong with being a dog? It's very nice. They have good fun. They run around all day and fight with each other and bark at everybody. He thought, and so Prabhupada said, okay, very good, I give you my blessings, become a dog. You know, so people want these things. What can we do about it, you know? And they're actually happy, they're thinking, very nice, you know, I'm a nice big dog. So we can't change people's you know, if people want these things, let them go and do it and then find out for themselves. We have to give them that, in, that right, that freedom. What's the other question? Maharaj, the other question is, uh, if a soul in its subtle body is punished in some hell, does that soul with its subtle body get the awareness and learning that it should not repeat its mis mistakes? Yes, of course, that's the idea of the suffering. But it's very easy for us to forget that we suffer. It's very, very easy. We forget how much suffering we've gone through. Just like every one of us in the course of our own life, we've suffered. But still we don't learn our lesson. One devotee's mother came to see Prabhupada and she was saying, Oh, it's so hot. Oh, I'm so hot. Oh, I'm suffering. It's so swelter. It's so terribly hot. And Prabhupada began to speak about the suffering in the material world. And then she began to object. She said, No, I don't think it's so bad. I don't think it's so bad. I don't think I'm suffering. And Prabhupada said, Prabhupada said, well, you were just saying suffering, how hot it was. And now you're saying, no, you're not suffering. So this is what happens. People forget. Although, although we have the memory of the suffering, we forget about that. Because we're so attached to sense gratification. And we just forget. Just like a man, he, he, you know, we hear, it's wrong to steal. So the intelligent person hears it's wrong to steal, he doesn't steal. But somebody else thinks he tries to steal and he gets caught and he is put in jail. And he suffers in the jail, but after he comes out, he steals again and he goes back to jail again, he doesn't learn. So sometimes it's very difficult to get through to people the, how much suffering is there and to remind people of the misery, the struggle, the difficulties which are there. It's not such an easy thing to convince people. And we don't like to be reminded. 
because we are so attached, we want to enjoy so much. Our desire for sense gratification is so strong, we don't want to remember about the suffering. And we are thinking, well, last time I didn't enjoy, but this time will be different. This time will be different. I couldn't, I wasn't lucky last time, but I'm sure I'll be happy this time. That's what happens. This is the nature of the conditioned soul. We're always trying to make excuses. We're always thinking, this time I'll do it. Last time, well, time before, and the time before that, and the time before that. I must be lucky this time. I, I'm sure I'm going to enjoy it this time. And people go ahead and, and they suffer. They don't learn. What can we do? What can be done? It's a very thankless task, trying to help people. Lord Sankarshan gets angry with them. Sometimes that's a good way to teach them, when you get angry with people. Then when you, when you get angry with them, then they learn, they take it more, become more serious. So very difficult sometimes to preach to people, to try to convince people about the nature of this world, and the nature of life. But we, we have to keep trying, we have to keep, we can't give up. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, Maharaj, as stated in the third canto, Maharaj, even uh, when we are in the womb of our mothers, you know, we pray to the Lord, you know, to come out of this. You know, you know we don't remember when we are within this body in what to speak of other bodies, you know, Maharaj? Mm, right. Yes, very good. That's a right, that's a nice example. Yeah, child in the womb. As soon as he comes out, it's all forgotten. <laughs> so the child prays, better I stay in the womb, better I shouldn't come out. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandavat Palam. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, in one of the shloka, in the third canto, uh, when Kapilamani is speaking to his mother Devahuti, it is explained that the child in the womb can remember hundred years, his previous hundred years, and he is asking for forgiveness, and he is saying, uh, "This should be my last birth. Oh my Lord, uh, I should not take birth again." And it is said, the moment the child takes birth, he forgets everything. And it is also said uh, to enlighten the woman who is going for progeny that when we are giving birth, we should not be like dogs and cats. Even though Prabhupada said we can have 100 children provided, they should be Krishna conscious. But it is explained that the woman should be enlightened about that whenever the birth is given, she has to undergo a labor pain and that is not labor pleasure. In spite of that, Maharaj, uh, uh, what to talk about the child? Even uh, we grown-ups also, you know, uh, we forget because that, that moment, that moment of you know gi giving birth, we undergo labor pain. Uh, recently, one of our uh, Bhaktivisha Mataji who has gone to US, she was three days she was facing the labor pain and she was not able to push the baby out and there was no parents no in-laws and then again and again she was telling you know please pray please pray for my child for my myself and on the third day night she delivered and after two days you know everybody was congratulating and they said you know congratulations you got a son and funny, you know, funny way, everybody said, now you've got a son, you can go for a daughter. And she happily said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she didn't, well, it was good she didn't want to go for cesarean, right? 
Yeah, yeah, yesterday. That's she, good. She pushed the baby normally. Yeah, that's good. She went for normal birth. So she suffered. You know, a lot of women today, they want, they want, they'll just go for cesarean, you know, they won't tolerate. They don't have that determ they don't have that patience, that determination. Yes, ma'am. Maharaj, thank you so very much, Maharaj. Uh, we have with us uh, Shivala Prabhu, who joined, and uh, he will say a few words. We request him to say a few words, Maharaj. Then we can uh, take the realization from the students. Is that okay, Maharaj? Okay, Prabhu. Yeah. Shivala Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances. I'll go Shivala Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, Thank you Prabhu. very, very much from Shridhar Mayapur for blessing the entire team. And... Uh, I think uh, this session has been going on, I think, for almost 20 days now. And uh, thank you very much for all the attention that you've given and all the devotees who have participated. Um, we look forward to more such sessions with you, Maharaj. And I hope uh, your health is perfectly okay right now. And, uh, you know, just the fact that you've been giving these classes and you've been continuously, you know, connected, teaching, Definitely says that you don't need to answer my question. It is automatically taken for granted that you're perfectly okay. Uh, thank you very, very much for your presence again. And thanks to uh, the entire team. I also thank uh, Jai Gohan Prabhu, Radha Madhav Mataji for coordinating and making this happen. Hare, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Very, my pleasure. I really enjoyed having the association and the opportunity to present this section of Srimad Bhagavatam. I found the devotees to be very wonderful and very enlightened and they give me a lot of encouragement to study it <laughs> because they're also on top of the subject, they're, they're very knowledgeable, very nice devotees. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. There is, a, there is a sort of a, a lockdown for devotees to travel from India at this particular moment. But sometimes we feel that Dubai is a little safer than in India. So I'm making an offer to you, Maharaj, if you want to be here with us after the lockdown. We don't mind taking care of you whether it's one month, two months, three months or so. I know you're enjoying the dam more than anything else, but <laughs> you, know, you may want to venture uh, uh, one trip if you want. Yeah, we have to wait for the lockdown. <laughs> Not easy to travel anywhere. I, I certainly don't want to leave India and, and, but unless I'm sure it can get back in. <laughs> because I, I think when there's a, a lockdown, this is the best place to be. True. At the moment, going out of India is the tough one. Coming back into India is not that difficult. So, <laughs> anyway. But you have taught the cosmology session, so I'm sure you can travel around the world. What's also inspiring is to see His Holiness Mahavishnu Swami Maharaj continuing to travel all around the globe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's still traveling, is he? <laughs> <laughs> Every day, different destination in the US, Europe, whatnot, South America. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maharaj, again. Hare Krishna. Thank you. My thanks to you for facilitating everything. Marriage. Over to you, Jai Gautam. Yeah, thank you, Shivala Prabhu. Uh, can I request uh, devotees to share your realization? Please, you can unmute yourself and uh, say a few words. Hare Krishna, Vendors Maharaj, Vendors His Grace Shri Prabhuji, and all the wonderful assembled Vaishnavas. Uh, this particular session was uh, really very enjoyable. And uh, Maharaj could give very humorously his insights, not making us become very tense, either with the subject matter or with the loaded purpose. He made it so light and easy for us, so we could go through the journey in a more comfortable manner. So special thanks to Maharaj for making it all happen. And also, I would heartfelt uh, thanks to His Grace Shivala Prabhu, who made us travel through this entire journey of being 
the probably the first batch of Bhakti Vaidhu students from Vidhavan Pradesh and giving us the opportunity to serve this wonderful scripture uh, for past several years that actually took us for completing this uh, journey. But it was very thoroughly enjoyed with so many different speakers, with so many different uh, uh, things to learn, to write, to recite, and as well as to buy heart. So it was a it was a complete journey, I would say, in the service of the great scripture. And along with that, I must also thank all the wonderful Mataji's and Prabhu's who have been the course students who have contributed greatly to enhance our understanding, be it the presentations, be it the lecture sessions, or sharing the thoughts during the whole session. That was all very inspiring and uh, interesting. And uh, some great speakers also who have uh, given us some wonderful insights. Hopefully, this will help us to serve the Srimad Bhagavatam more and more eagerly in our future um, practices as well as in our preaching sessions and to continue further in the journey of uh, completing the whole Srimad Bhagavatam as the 12 cantos. So, I would heartily thank every one of you and uh, especially to Maharaj and Sri Vala Prabhu and the course coordinators as Jai Govind Prabhu and Radha Madhav Mataji they have been really great. They really pulled us all together. We were drifting in so many times, but they caught us up and uh, gave us the push to continue and to uh, able to serve those wonderful scriptures. So, heartfelt thanks. And uh, though this is probably the last session that we are going to go through for the Srimad Bhagavatam as part of Bhakti Vaibhu, but I am certainly hopeful that we can meet together and do many other great sessions as well. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Dandak pranams to everybody. Uh, Maharaj, please accept my obeisances. I'm Sugna Vrinda Devidasi. My heartfelt congratulations and thank you first of all to my classmates. A big thanks to my poor faculty members for conducting these courses and all the faculty members that we were fortunate enough, right from Atul Krishna Prabhu, Radhika Nagri Prabhu, uh, Padmanen Prabhu, and we were blessed this time with Maharaj's wonderful association and enlightening us. Maharaj, no words, I have no words, uh, as this study of Bhagavatam, of course we say it is Rasamalyam, but then to say Rasamalyam, but then to get it from the uh, pure souls and then to get the insight of it, right? This cosmology, wherein we all said, you know, the earth is round and something else is moving. And then now we understand, oh, what we understand is nothing and something else is stationed. You know, it's totally, you know, has changed our uh, uh, sight. Uh, we want to thank you. Uh, we want to thank each each one of the uh, Mayapur uh, faculty members. A special thanks to Shivala Prabhu uh, because we are now proud that uh, uh, from our yatra, you know, we have uh, a batch who has done Bhakti Vaibhava. Uh, Shivala Prabhu will be very proud of it. Thank you, Prabhuji. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, my thanks to uh, Jai Govind Prabhu and Radha Madha Mataji. My special thanks to Jagan Prabhu because I cannot forget him uh, because uh, he is the one who uh, started, you know, and we have troubled him a lot. We have troubled him a lot. And that trouble we have given to Jai Govind Prabhu and Radha Madha Mataji also. So we want to, you know, apologize for it. And because of you, uh, especially Radha Madha Mataji, you know, the way she has been chasing with us and all the assessments, it was, it was not an easy journey, but today we can say it was successful uh, because this Shastrik study, only after, it's like, you know, Devi Asha Gunamayama Mamaya Durataya. So now we are this way, you know, we have crossed over, so we can say, oh, yes, we have relished it, and we want others to also come, come forward. This should be our aim when we have got enlightened. Uh, this is the aim, and that's what uh, we have to do. Uh, so, I want to thank my, uh, uh, all the uh, 
co uh, mates also because without uh, everybody's uh, support we would have not able to do this so thank you very much once again hari krishna hari krishna maraj pe rakhe pa hum log bhi hari krishna shivam kuri hari krishna hari hari uh thank you so much i it's it's like uh, i can't believe that a person like me a school failure is has done bhakti well it's 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 unbelievable it's all because of the support from all the the classmates of mine the senior devotees and from my upper institute that a person like me uh, has done a bhakti yoga i really thank everyone here to please bless me so i can continue this study of mine you know and try to imbibe the moods and missions of shila prabhu thank you shila prabhu for giving us so much opportunities that even in this midst of lockdown we are able to do so much study and understand and get the association of devotees from all around the world thank you all glories to shila prabhu thank you hari krishna maharaj first of all uh, i started my shastri studies with maharaj he was our first teacher for bhakti shastri and now when we uh, am ending the bhakti vaibhav course he is the teacher for coincidence uh, thank you maharaj i would like to thank shri vala prabhu jayadev uh, devati uh, mata ji and jagan prabhu and finally radha madhav mata ji and jagan prabhu for facilitating this course um this time one of the share one thing when my son and son is studying abroad so when he wanted to do the bhakti shastri there uh, they, they were having certain conditions that they must stand 16 rounds and they must every week they have to do temple service so here we are uh, like uh, we don't have any such conditions like we are comfortably we are doing our course and um, many of us many of the like uh, uh, the students may not be chanting 15 rounds or like but, but when they are as they do the course slowly they understand and they improve themselves uh, but, uh, but many of the places it is not easy so like those whoever is in this forum just a request please take it seriously and uh, thanks to all my uh, fellow students hari krishna Hare Krishna please accept my humble obeisance with all glories to Shila Prabhupada Hare Krishna uh, so uh, it has been an amazing experience although i think jay govind prabhu i have missed a few units in the beginning but still nevertheless it's it's been really uh, really very very uh, deep study of shrimad bhagavatam i must say and uh, thank the yatra thank the academy of vedic sciences and thank all the great teachers who guided us through uh, each and every shlok each and every translation each and every purport in detail and so many times we uh, didn't know there is so much there actually and uh, devotees have come and like literally dug into each verse and explained it from uh, different commentaries of different acharyas and uh, meanings which we couldn't have otherwise even comprehended on Uh, so thank you very much it's been very nice it's been very engaging it's relived the old uh, school memories of writing exams again which has been uh, out and we were again felt like students writing exam writing close book so yeah it's been a great experience and especially this particular unit of vedic cosmology has been so uh, so enlivening in realizing the fact that we are so insignificant the way the entire cosmology is set up and uh, what do we even know about it practically uh, nothing and uh, it just makes us feel how tiny we are and really it's, it's been a nice experience and uh, i could say that uh, there are many devotees here 
who are not students but are still joined the special so i'm sure that uh, this is a lifetime opportunity for each and every one to uh, attach themselves to these courses and uh, take part in them as students thank you very much once again and uh, special thanks to all the course students all the organizers and all the devotees who came and blessed us with the teachings thank you darbat pranam hari krishna Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisances. Um, um, this was a, like a great journey. Even though you know uh, myself and my wife has not come in between, there are some classes missed. So, but we somehow managed to complete uh, you know the complete. So we are very fortunate uh, to have you, uh, especially for the, the the end of the session, the cosmo cosmology this thing, uh, cosmology. So. it was very uh, uh, it was a very uh, very good uh, journey for us like you know uh, we we could understand uh, in depth of uh, shrimad bhagavatam but still we are still you know very minor in this uh, uh, course but there's still a long way to go still you know and uh, the entire course uh, uh, devotees come from my pool you know uh, teaching us so it was a very good uh, uh, enlightening for for, uh, for both of us so um still we need to uh, uh, really uh, you know put it uh, in our life so uh, we need uh, your blessings maharaj so that the now we uh, imbibe uh, uh, your teachings uh, your uh, uh, shri prabhupas uh, uh, the informations and all so uh, please bless us maharaj so that uh, we can let uh, it take up this so conscious still um, yeah, we are, you know get to extend and then the spread the message Thank you, Rajma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rajma. Thank you very much. Do it quickly. Please do it quickly because uh, you know, it's already getting late for Maharaj. Whoever wants to share their realization, please quickly come on. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. So this was uh, the whole study of. The Bhakti Vaibhav was really a great journey for me. I had read the full Bhagavatam before doing this Bhakti Vaibhav, but when I started reading Bhakti Vaibhav, then I realized that I had not understood anything before when I read, and only I understood Bhagavatam little bit when I started doing of Bhakti Vaibhav with the teachers, explaining it and learning by writing essays and questions and in the classes so many discussions. So really, uh, I can't say that I have learned so much, but whatever I have learned, this is all because of these courses, which is really helping uh, in my life also, and and whatever little bit teaching we are doing also, it is helping there the understanding. So I'm really thankful for this great journey of learning Shiva Bhagavatam, and look forward to do the further courses also. And thanks to all the course students and all the. Uh, my this uh, Jai Govind Prabhu and Radha Madhav Madhav Ji really, as everybody said, we have troubled them a lot by not submitting paper on time, not doing shlokas on time. <laughs> so <laughs> they are always bearing with us. So uh, hopefully, we whatever is left, we will try to complete as soon as possible in terms of uh, not giving the papers and complete this course as early as possible. Thank you so much, everyone. Hari Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept uh, my humble obeisance. Uh, as a uh, first unit, uh, we heard it from you, and even the sixth and the fifth unit also, fifth uh, can't also from you. We are really very fortunate. Uh, and uh, uh, the one thing I realized is uh, uh, the way you are uh, putting us uh, the chapters uh, and. Uh, in condensed form and uh, in elaborate way and uh, we are under understanding that uh, in very nice way and you are making us uh, so easy even if we read two three times also we will not able to understand uh, but uh, when we attend your sessions uh, it is we can understand it very easily and uh, 
I really like the uh, that uh, uh, real life. That is one of the realization I had, and uh, a lot of things are there to implement in our uh, life. And we need uh, your blessings. We need to hear more and more from you, Maharaj. And uh, I myself, I feel uh, very fortunate uh, to do Bhakti Vaibhav and also with the association of our uh, Damodar Desh Yatra devotees. And also that too with uh, uh, Jagan Prabhu and uh, Rev Pati Gopi Mataji's mercy and also uh, Radha Madha Mataji and uh, Jai Govind Prabhu. Really, we troubled them in submitting the the essays and uh, shlokas, all these things. We need everyone's association and uh, without a devotee's association, nothing is possible. And uh, even in this COVID time, and especially uh, Balla Prabhu has arranged for us uh, many sessions, many units, so and keeping us engaged in our day-to-day activities we really, we are, our, uh, we cannot, uh, you know, that Runa, we cannot uh, do any of this thing. So, really thankful for the Dhamodar Desh Yatra and to Mayapur Institute especially and to all, one and all who is uh, with us. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank Hare Krishna, we always need your blessings, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Please make it uh, really crisp. Only one minute, please. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. May humble obeisances and Hare Krishna to all the Vishavas. Um, my sincere thanks to all the organizers and Maharaj. Because of this lockdown period, I got the opportunity to attend the sessions. Most of the sessions be in this lockdown period only. For I couldn't get a chance to continue my sessions. So I have to thank this situation to the Lord to make this situation and make us to actually attend this session fully and by the mercy of Maharaj and uh, I also actually got the opportunity to hear this nectar Srimad Bhagavatam from Maharaj and it was really helpful and it is actually help us to understand Bhagavatam clearly as many of them told. So thank you, Mother, and thank you for your wonderful association. I want to continue because of your uh, class. Mm-hmm. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. Um, uh, thank you, Maharaj, and all my other Siksha Gurus for arranging these classes and uh, also this Dhamma these leaders and uh, Jagun Prabhu and Yatha Madhu Madhaji because because of their effort, this happened. Uh, if Damodar just did not arrange such thing, I will never get an opportunity to study Srimad Bhagavatam. So I am thankful to all of you, and I am praying God to continue this class. I don't know. I need blessing from you, Maharaj, and all others. Hare all Vaishnavis. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. I am very to you, Maharaj, and all the devotees and all the others who have embraced me to attend this class. I believe it is very different for me uh, because uh, it is totally in English language and uh, actually I don't know more English. And because of this class, I am learning everyday English. <laughs> because of all Vaishnava, it is uh, possible to attend these all classes. They are helped too much to attend this class and complete all essays and all social lessons. Otherwise, I, I, I cannot do this all by us. <laughs> <laughs> I, this all together I started Bhakti Bhagavan and Bhakti Sastri. Together I started in 2012 and until now is uh, two days. And because of all Vaishnava Parsi, I have completed this. Hare Krishna Maharaj, 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 Hare and we can utilize that in our preaching activities, in our practical appeal, 
application. Thank you very much, Maharaj. And uh, I want to say thanks to our AARC, Shri Vanda Prabhu, and our organizers, Radha Madhav, and Jango. Thanks, and especially my classmates. With their company, we really enjoy. I think 35 years back, my studentship, really, I recalled the writing exams, telling the shlokas, discussions. We thoroughly enjoyed. Thanks, Shivala, once again. Mara, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you very much for the wonderful classes. Uh, the last three units you have been teaching us. Uh, we have learned a lot, though the topics were slightly difficult, but you made it so simple and easy for us to understand. And also you gave your association. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Shrivala Prabhu uh, for allowing us to have this Bhakti Vibe, especially during this COVID. Never realized that one year passed in. Um, we got to hear uh, so much from Srimad Bhagavatam and also all the devotees who have been part of this Bhakti Vibe. Also, please forgive me for all the offenses I have committed in this journey of Bhakti Vibe. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shilpa Prabhupada and all glories to Your Holiness. Uh, when this topic came up uh, uh, in the Unit 24, very cosmology, uh, His Grace Padman and Prabhu said, Maharaj is, you know, gracefully agreed to take this unit. We are so happy, Maharaj, for accepting and teaching this wonderful uh, uh, unit, though it's very complicated. But you made it very simple. Of course, still, uh, you know, there's a lot to understand. But with your blessing, we will surely do it. And uh, thank you for tolerating us. And uh, please, uh, uh, please excuse us for all offenses. We are committed, Maharaj. Please bless us. So we will continue our journey, you know, in doing the Srimad Bhagavatam, especially Bhakti Vedanta. And uh, special thanks to Shivala Prabhu, because and Jagan Prabhu both together and because of them we are sitting in the uh, in Dhamma Desh we could able to de do this complete Bhakti Vaibha unit uh, so this is uh, I'm, I can proudly say this is the first batch Shivala Prabhu outside Mayapur the Bhakti Vaibha is happening this is the first batch uh, so, uh, so, uh, I didn't know that uh, yes so thank you so much uh, and uh, especially you and uh, Jagan Prabhu for initiating this Shastrik studies in Dhamma Desh and uh, we are indebted to you and Mayapur Institute and to Maharaj, Padmanayan Prabhu, Radhika Nagar Prabhu, Atul Krishna Prabhu, uh, Harilila Prabhu and these are the teachers who taught us in this unit and we started this journey on uh, 1st May 2012 and uh, we are completing today. It's almost uh, uh, nine years journey and it's a great journey. It's very you know, memorable journey. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, dear devotees, please uh, uh, accept our apologies and please uh, forgive us for all our offenses, you know. So sometimes, you know, we have to use all tricks, you know, to get the timely uh, assessment. Please, it, please excuse us. Thank you very much. Ajay Prabhu, I just wanted to say one thing here. Uh, I don't know why it took us this long anyway. I think we need to keep doing it. I, uh, possibly we are already having second and third batches happening out now, right now. We need to speed up. I was thinking being the first batch and first batch outside of Mayapur, etc. It will be good to have a small uh, sort of a pamphlet made with a photo of all the students, with their name, with a small note as a feedback, a list of all the teachers, and uh, who taught the different modules and I think it will be good to uh, you know just have that very beautiful and you know once you do that we can also circulate it to the Atra to say these we are proud of these people any of you can call them for Srimad Bhagavatam lectures and classes <laughs> as well it will be good to attract more students to come along and we can make a big poster with all, with all the all the photos of the students so that they remember each other's faces and keep it in their house. Hare Krishna. <laughs> and definitely the teachers come on the top. Shila Prabhupada on the top. Uh, the teachers at the next level. And then we have the wonderful students. <laughs> and so it's wonderful. 
thank you all very much for this uh, patience uh, forgive us but i think um, in the past we might have been searching for teachers teachers will have to find their time to come now all that is simplified we can find teachers and now you can all become teachers too mm -hmm. and so i think there's no harm in uh, you know the, 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 there's no more excuse to extend it for nine years and do a phd you have all done phd you possibly studied shrimad bhagavatam nine times in these nine years huh? to come up but it will be good we speed up and also encourage more and more people to do that okay. sure sure we'll, prove, we'll do that ah uh, pramod mata ji do you want to say few words aap hindi mein bhi bol sakte hain uh, nan kishor prabhu you can translate quickly yes yes prabhu हरे कृष्ण प्रभु पिताजी प्रणाम महाराज प्रणाम प्रभु जी मुझे तो प्रभु जी सबसे पहले कि आई एम सो लकी कि मैं इस ग्रुप के एक पार्ट हूँ और सबको बस प्रभु जी थैंक यू बोलना चाहती हूँ माता जी सेड शी इज वेरी लकी टू बी अ पार्ट ऑफ दिस ग्रुप एंड वांट्स टू थैंक एवरीवन हरे कृष्ण जय गोविंद प्रभु जी लास्ट वन वर्ड यू नो द ब्यूटी ऑफ वी ऑल कुड कंप्लीट दिस because uh, we should be proud of our yatra leader because he, he his mood is you know in this one minute he has said you know globally he wants to uh, send our you know uh, pictures and all so because of uh, his uh, this mood we were able to you know uh, get this journey done you know thank you shivala prabhu once again patip pan prabhu are you there Okay, over to you, Maharaj. Uh, final words from you, Maharaj, and uh, after you and Shiva Prabhu. Over to you, Maharaj. All right. So thank you all very much for having me, and giving me the opportunity to participate in this journey. I certainly feel it's something very worthwhile. That studying Shiva Prabhu's books is the best use I can make of my time. And I'm so grateful to all of you to give me the opportunity that I could also take part in it. I think when we study, it's it's so much easier when we do it with other people. If you do it on your own, you don't get so much done. You don't take in so much. But when we come together and try to learn things, it's so much more. There's so much more comes out of it. And I certainly feel this is true. That when we come together, that. Uh, many hands make light work and i think i, I really get a, a lot of benefit out of being with all of you and i thank you very much for your participation hari krishna yeah uh, kalpatar janma mata ji do you want to say a realization yeah hari krishna maharaj Uh, please accept my humble obeisances maraj uh, this um, actually uh, this, i've been very fortunate to be a part of this group because i joined in between and uh, i was doing module 1 but because of lockdown i had the opportunity to uh, do module 2 i i started only in between but uh, it was been uh, it was uh, really a uh, amazing and very uh, a wonderful journey maraj because studying shastrik studies has been uh, i love doing that and uh, it's really nice uh, like uh, the way uh, all the teachers have explained was uh, gives us real insight of the bhagavatam like other people have said that other devotees have said like reading bhagavatam ourselves and maraj also said that it, i don't understand anything maraj <laughs> at least coming from the teachers uh, you you know really what the prabhupal means and has said in the bhagavatam and what he is uh, trying to explain to us so it has been really my fortune to go through this course uh, please bless 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 all of us maraj and bless me so that i can go through with the shastrik studies hare krishna maraj hare krishna Thank you, Shilpa. Pro final words from you, and uh, we can end the session. So Hare Krishna. So please continue to study, and it is very important that uh, we are constantly revising.
constantly reading, constantly speaking. Uh, I think it is very important that all the time that you have invested, uh, the, the fruit of that you see only when you have passed it on to others. We have wonderful opportunities in the uh, Nithyam Bhagavata Sevya, various other forums, even for the ladies that we have. I think all of you should become speakers and uh, reach out this message. Uh, churn it further and further, read uh, the, the various uh, cantos again and again, the very nice, beautiful books from uh, the Gordhan Eco Village that is by uh, Gauranga Darshan Prabhu are very book guide books for canto by canto, though it's not complete with all the cantos yet, but at least you can cover till the ninth canto. It's important that all of you own Jaiwan Prabhu. As a gift from Dhamudu Desh Yatra, I want to gift to every one of the Bhakti Vaiba students the entire set of nine Bhagavata Subodhini. Okay? So please uh, place an order and let us gift it to all the uh, students who have done the Bhakti Vaibhav. And I think this should be a gift for all those who are doing it, even in the other backpacks. So let's place the order for all of them. So it will be beneficial for them. It will be beneficial for everyone. So I think it is something that uh, we have to do. And uh, thank you all. You are all the star preachers of Dhamudu Desh. Uh, let's, I hope all of you have done your TTC. We need to organize a TTC session so that you can also in an organized way start uh, teaching Bhakti Shastri and Bhakti Vaibhava. So the sky is the limit. What we've done is a very small number. I think we need to expand into the whole world and so much more that we can explore with the digital revolution. Thank you all. Maharaj, we always seek your blessings. Thank you for your wonderful humility for being there with us spending your personal time of so many hours and uh, Mara, there's so much of uh, so much for us to learn every visit of yours has been learning just your humility uh, is just enough just when we meet you it, it touches us to say how we are so arrogant and how we have to learn about everything I know many people have quoted my name I have done hardly anything in this particular session but you have been there, Maharaj, guiding them right through every day, answering all their questions, you know, listening to all the Mataji's talk, listening to uh, all the jokes. I think, you know, you've made, I think yourself, you know, you are so light uh, uh, in such a way that, you know, Mataji's and to all students could really relate and deal with you. And Maharaj, we thank you very much for that simplicity in you and your humility, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Please bless us all. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Jai